Rue Barry. For let philosopher and doctor preach of what they will and what they will not, each is but one link in an eternal chain that none can slip, nor break, nor overreach. Crimson nor yellow roses, nor the savour of the mounting sea are worth the perfume I adore that clings to thee. The languid-headed lilies tire, the changeless waters weary me. I ache with passionate desire of thine and thee. There are but these things in the world, thy mouth of fire, thy breasts, thy hands, thy hair upcurled, and my desire. 1. One morning at Julian's, a student said to Selby, That is Foxhall Clifford, pointing with his brushes at a young man who sat before an easel, doing nothing. Selby, shy and nervous, walked over and began, My name is Selby. I have just arrived in Paris, and bring a letter of introduction. His voice was lost in the crash of a falling easel, the owner of which promptly assaulted his neighbour, and for a time the noise of battle rolled through the studios of M. M. Boulanger and Lefebvre, presently subsiding into a scuffle on the stairs outside. Selby, apprehensive as to his own reception in the studio, looked at Clifford, who sat serenely watching the fight. "'It's a little noisy here,' said Clifford, "'but you will like the fellows when you know them.' His unaffected manner delighted Selby. Then, with a simplicity that won his heart, he presented him to half a dozen students of as many nationalities. Some were cordial, all were polite. Even the majestic creature who held the position of Massier, unbent enough to say, My friend, when a man speaks French as well as you do, and is also a friend of Monsieur Clifford, he will have no trouble in this studio. You expect, of course, to fill the stove until the next new man comes? Of course. And you don't mind, chaff? No, replied Selby, who hated it. Clifford, much amused, put on his hat, saying, You must expect lots of it at first. Selby placed his own hat on his head and followed him to the door. As they passed the model stand, there was a furious cry of, Chapeau! Chapeau! And a student sprang from his easel, menacing Selby, who reddened but looked at Clifford. Take off your hat for them, said the latter, laughing. A little embarrassed, he turned and saluted the studio. Et moi? cried the model. You are charming, replied Selby, astonished at his own audacity. But the studio rose as one man, shouting, He has done well! He's all right! While the model, laughing, kissed her hand to him and cried, A demon bougenome! All that week Selby worked at the studio unmolested. The French students christened him L'Enfant Prodigue, which was freely translated, The Prodigious Infant, The Kid, Kid Selby, and Kidby. But the disease soon ran its course from Kidby to Kidney, and then naturally to Tidbits, where it was arrested by Clifford's authority and ultimately relapsed to Kid. Wednesday came, and with it M. Boulanger. For three hours the students writhed under his biting sarcasms, among the others Clifford, who was informed that he knew even less about a work of art than he did about the art of work. Selby was more fortunate. The professor examined his drawing in silence, looked at him sharply, and passed on with a non-committal gesture. He presently departed arm in arm with Bouguereau, to the relief of Clifford, who was then at liberty to jam his hat on his head and depart. The next day he did not appear, and Selby, who had counted on seeing him at the studio, a thing which he learned later it was vanity to count on, wandered back to the Latin quarter alone. Paris was still strange and new to him. He was vaguely troubled by its splendour. No tender memories stirred his American bosom at the place de Châtelet, nor even by Notre Dame. The Palais de Justice, with its clock and turrets, and stalking sentinels in blue and vermilion, the Place Saint Michel, with its jumble of omnibuses and ugly water spitting griffins, the hill of the Boulevard Saint Michel, the tooting trams, the policemen dawdling two by two, and the table lined terraces of the Cafe Vasset were nothing to him, as yet, nor did he even know when he stepped from the stones of the Place Saint-Michel to the asphalt of the boulevard, 
that he had crossed the frontier and entered the student zone, the famous Latin Quarter. A cabman hailed him as bourgeois and urged the superiority of driving over walking. A gayman, with an appearance of great concern, requested the latest telegraphic news from London, and then, standing on his head, invited Selby to feats of strength. A pretty girl gave him a glance from a pair of violet eyes. He did not see her, but she, catching her own reflection in a window, wondered at the colour burning in her cheeks. Turning to resume her course, she met Foxhall Clifford, and hurried on. Clifford, open-mouthed, followed her with his eyes. Then he looked after Selby, who had turned into the Boulevard Saint-Germain, toward the Rue de Seine. Then he examined himself in the shop window. The results seemed to be unsatisfactory. I'm not a beauty, he mused, but neither am I a hobgoblin. What does she mean by blushing at Selby? I never before saw her look at a fellow in my life, neither has anyone in the quarter. Anyway, I can swear she never looks at me, and goodness knows I've done all that respectful adoration can do. He sighed, and murmuring a prophecy concerning the salvation of his immortal soul, swung into that graceful lounge which at all times characterized Clifford. With no apparent exertion, he overtook Selby at the corner, and together they crossed the sunlit boulevard and sat down under the awning of the Café du Cercle. Clifford bowed to everybody on the terrace, saying, "'You shall meet them all later, but now let me present you to two of the sights of Paris, Mr. Richard Elliot and Mr. Stanley Roden.' The sights looked amiable, and took vermouth. "'You cut the studio today?' said Elliot, suddenly turning on Clifford, who avoided his eyes. "'To commune with nature?' observed Roden. "'What's her name this time?' asked Elliot, and Roden answered promptly, "'Name, Yvette, nationality, Breton.' Wrong, replied Clifford blandly. It's Rue Barry. The subject changed instantly, and Selby listened in surprise to names which were new to him, and eulogies on the latest Pre de Rome winner. He was delighted to hear opinions boldly expressed and points honestly debated, although the vehicle was mostly slang, both English and French. He longed for the time when he too should be plunged into the strife for fame. The bells of Sansul Peace struck the hour and the palace of the Luxembourg answered chime on chime. With a glance at the sun, dipping low in the golden dust behind the Palais Bourbon, they rose and, turning to the east, crossed the Boulevard Saint-Germain and sauntered toward the École de Médecine. At the corner, a girl passed them, walking hurriedly. Clifford smirked, Elliot and Roden were agitated, but they all bowed, and, without raising her eyes, she returned their salute. But Selby, who had lagged behind, fascinated by some gay shop window, looked up to meet two of the bluest eyes he had ever seen. The eyes were dropped in an instant, and the young fellow hastened to overtake the others. "'By Jove!' he said. "'Do you fellows know I have just seen the prettiest girl?' An exclamation broke from the trio, gloomy, foreboding, like the chorus in a Greek play. "'Rue Barry!' "'What?' cried Selby, bewildered. The only answer was a vague gesture from Clifford. Two hours later, during dinner, Clifford turned to Selby and said, "'You want to ask me something. I can tell by the way you fidget about.' "'Yes, I do,' he said, innocently enough. "'It's about that girl. Who is she?' In Roden's smile, there was pity. In Elliot's, bitterness. "'Her name,' said Clifford solemnly, "'is unknown to anyone. At least,' he added with much conscientiousness, as far as I can learn. Every fellow in the quarter bows to her, and she returns the salute gravely, but no man has ever been known to obtain more than that. Her profession, judging from her music role, is that of a pianist. Her residence is in a small and humble street, which is kept in a perpetual process of repair by the city authorities, and from the black letters painted on the barrier, which defends the street from traffic, she has taken the name by which we know her, Rue Barry. Mr. Roden, in his imperfect knowledge of the French tongue, called our attention to it as Rue Barry. I didn't, said Roden hotly. And Rue Barry, or Rue Barry, is today an object of adoration to every rapon in the quarter. We are not rapons, corrected Elliot. I am not, returned Clifford. 
and I beg to call to your attention, Selby, that these two gentlemen have at various and apparently unfortunate moments offered to lay down life and limb at the feet of Rue Barry. The lady possesses a chilling smile which she uses on such occasions, and here he became gloomily impressive. I have been forced to believe that neither the scholarly grace of my friend Elliot nor the buxom beauty of my friend Roden have touched that heart of ice. Elliot and Roden, boiling with indignation, cried out, "'And you!' "'I,' said Clifford blandly, "'do fear to tread where you rush in.'" 2. 24 hours later, Selby had completely forgotten Rue Barry. During the week, he worked with might and main at the studio, and Saturday night found him so tired that he went to bed before dinner and had a nightmare about a river of yellow ochre in which he was drowning. Sunday morning, apropos of nothing at all, he thought of Rue Barry, and ten seconds afterwards he saw her. It was at the flower market on the marble bridge. She was examining a pot of pansies. The gardener had evidently thrown heart and soul into the transaction, but Rue Barry shook her head. It is a question whether Selby would have stopped then and there to inspect a cabbage rose, had not Clifford unwound for him the yarn of the previous Tuesday. It is possible that his curiosity was piqued, for with the exception of a hen turkey, a boy of nineteen is the most openly curious biped alive. From twenty until death, he tries to conceal it. But, to be fair to Selby, it is also true that the market was attractive. Under a cloudless sky, the flowers were packed and heaped along the marble bridge to the parapet. The air was soft, the sun spun a shadowy lacework among the palms and glowed in the hearts of a thousand roses. Spring had come, was in full tide. The watering carts and sprinklers spread freshness over the boulevard, the sparrows had become vulgarly obtrusive, and the credulous sane angler anxiously followed his gaudy quill floating among the soapsuds of the Lavoise. The white spiked chestnuts, clad in tender green, vibrated with the hum of bees. Shoddy butterflies flaunted their winter rags among the heliotrope. There was a smell of fresh earth in the air, an echo of the woodland brook in the ripple of the Seine, and swallows soared and skimmed among the anchored river craft. Somewhere in a window, a caged bird was singing its heart out to the sky. Selby looked at the cabbage rose, and then at the sky. Something in the song of the caged bird may have moved him, or perhaps it was that dangerous sweetness in the air of May. At first he was hardly conscious that he had stopped, then he was scarcely conscious why he had stopped, then he thought he would move on, then he thought he wouldn't, then he looked at Rue Barry. The gardener said, Mademoiselle, this is undoubtedly a fine pot of pansies. Rue Barry shook her head. The gardener smiled. She evidently did not want the pansies. She had bought many pots of pansies there, two or three every spring, and never argued. What did she want, then? The pansies were evidently a feeler toward a more important transaction. The gardener rubbed his hands and gazed about him. These juleps are magnificent, he observed, and these hyacinths— He fell into a trance at the mere sight of the scented thickets. That, murmured Rue, pointing to a splendid rose-bush with her furled parasol, but in spite of her, her voice trembled a little. Selby noticed it, more shame to him that he was listening, and the gardener noticed it, and, burying his nose in the roses, scented a bargain. Still, to do him justice, he did not add a centime to the honest value of the plant, for after all, Rue was probably poor, and anyone could see she was charming. Fifty francs, mademoiselle. The gardener's tone was grave. Rue felt that argument would be wasted. They both stood silent for a moment. The gardener did not eulogize his prize. The rose tree was gorgeous, and anyone could see it. I will take the pansies, said the girl, and drew two francs from a worn purse. Then she looked up. A teardrop stood in the way, refracting the light like a diamond, but as it rolled into a little corner by her nose, a vision of Selby replaced it, and when a brush of the handkerchief had cleared the startled blue eyes, Selby himself appeared, very much embarrassed. He instantly looked up into the sky, apparently devoured with a thirst for astronomical research, 
and as he continued his investigations for fully five minutes, the gardener looked up too, and so did a policeman. Then Selby looked at the tips of his boots, the gardener looked at him, and the policeman slouched on. Rue Barry had been gone some time. What? said the gardener. May I offer monsieur? Selby never knew why, but he suddenly began to buy flowers. The gardener was electrified. Never before had he sold so many flowers, never at such satisfying prices, and never, never with such absolute unanimity of opinion with a customer. But he missed the bargaining, the arguing, the calling of heaven to witness. The transaction lacked spice. These tulips are magnificent. They are, cried Selby warmly. But alas, they are dear. I will take them. Dear, murmured the gardener in a perspiration. He's mad as a most Englishman. This cactus is gorgeous. Alas, send it with the rest. The gardener braced himself against the river wall. That splendid rose bush, he began faintly. That is a beauty. I believe it is fifty francs. He stopped, very red. The gardener relished his confusion. Then a sudden cool self-possession took the place of his momentary confusion, and he held the gardener with his eye, and bullied him. I'll take that bush. Why did not the young lady buy it? Mademoiselle is not wealthy. How do you know? Dame, I sell her many pansies. Pansies are not expensive. Those are the pansies she bought? These, monsieur, the blue and gold. Then you intend to send them to her? At midday after the market. Take this rose bush with them, and— Here he glared at the gardener. Don't you dare say from whom they came. The gardener's eyes were like saucers, but Selby, calm and victorious, said, Send the others to the Hotel de Senna, seven rue de Tournon. I will leave directions with a concierge. Then he buttoned his glove with much dignity and stalked off. But when well around the corner and hidden from the gardener's view, the conviction that he was an idiot came home to him in a furious blush. Ten minutes later, he sat in his room in the Hotel de Senna, repeating with an imbecile smile, What an ass I am! What an ass! An hour later found him in the same chair, in the same position, his hat and gloves still on, his stick in his hand, but he was silent, apparently lost in contemplation of his boot toes, and his smile was less imbecile and even a bit retrospective. 3. About five o'clock that afternoon, the little sad-eyed woman who fills the position of concierge at the Hotel de Senna held up her hands in amazement to see a wagon-load of flower-bearing shrubs draw up before the doorway. She called Joseph, the intemperate garçon, who, while calculating the value of the flowers in Petit Vert, gloomily disclaimed any knowledge as to their destination. Voyons, said the little concierge. Cherchons la femme. You, he suggested. The little woman stood a moment, pensive, and then sighed. Joseph caressed his nose, a nose which for gaudiness could vie with any floral display. Then the gardener came in, hat in hand, and a few minutes later Selby stood in the middle of his room, his coat off, his shirt sleeves rolled up. The chamber originally contained, besides the furniture, about two square feet of walking room, and now this was occupied by a cactus. The bed groaned under crates of pansies, lilies, and heliotrope. The lounge was covered with hyacinths and tulips, and the washstand supported a species of young tree warranted to bear flowers at some time or other. Clifford came in a little later, fell over a box of sweet peas, swore a little, apologized, and then, as the full splendor of the floral fate burst upon him, sat down in astonishment upon a geranium. The geranium was a wreck, but Selby said, Don't mind, and glared at the cactus. Are you going to give a ball? demanded Clifford. No, I'm very fond of flowers, said Selby, but the statement lacked enthusiasm. I should imagine so. Then, after a silence, that's a fine cactus. Selby contemplated the cactus, touched it with the air of a connoisseur, and pricked his thumb. Clifford poked a pansy with his stick. Then Joseph came in with the bill, announcing the sum total in a loud voice, partly to impress Clifford, partly to intimidate Selby into disgorging a pourboire, which he would share, if he chose, with the gardener. Clifford tried to pretend that he had not heard, while Selby paid bill and tribute without a murmur. 
Then he lounged back into the room with an attempt at indifference, which failed entirely when he tore his trousers on the cactus. Clifford made some commonplace remark, lighted a cigarette, and looked out of the window to give Selby a chance. Selby tried to take it, but getting as far as, "'Yes, spring is here at last,' froze solid. He looked at the back of Clifford's head. It expressed volumes. Those little perked-up ears seemed tingling with suppressed glee. He made a desperate effort to master the situation, and jumped up to reach for some Russian cigarettes as an incentive to conversation, but was foiled by the cactus, to whom again he fell a prey. The last straw was added. Damn the cactus! This observation was wrung from Selby against his will, against his own instinct of self-preservation, but the thorns on the cactus were long and sharp, and at their repeated prick his pent-up wrath escaped. It was too late now. It was done. Anne Clifford had wheeled around. See here, Selby, why the deuce did you buy those flowers? I'm fond of them, said Selby. What are you going to do with them? You can't sleep here. I could, if you'd help me take the pansies off the bed. Where can you put them? Couldn't I give them to the concierge? As soon as he said it, he regretted it. What in heaven's name would Clifford think of him? He had heard the amount of the bill. Would he believe that he had invested in these luxuries as a timid declaration to his concierge? And would the Latin Quarter comment upon it in their own brutal fashion? He dreaded ridicule, and he knew Clifford's reputation. Then somebody knocked. Selby looked at Clifford with a hunted expression, which touched that young man's heart. It was a confession, and at the same time a supplication. Clifford jumped up, threaded his way through the floral labyrinth, and putting an eye to the crack of the door, said, "'Who the devil is it? This graceful style of reception is indigenous to the quarter. It's Elliot,' he said, looking back, "'and Roden, too, and their bulldogs.' Then he addressed them through the crack. "'Sit down on the stairs. Selby and I are coming out directly. Discretion is a virtue. The Latin quarter possesses few, and discretion seldom figures on the list.' They sat down and began to whistle. Presently, Rodan called out, "'I smell flowers. They feast within.' "'You ought to know Selby better than that,' growled Clifford behind the door, while the other hurriedly exchanged his torn trousers for others. "'We know Selby,' said Elliot, with emphasis. "'Yes,' said Rodan. "'He gives receptions with floral decorations, and invites Clifford while we sit on the stairs. "'Yes, while the youth and beauty of the quarter revel,' suggested Rodan, then, with sudden misgiving, "'Is Odette there?' "'See here,' demanded Elliot. "'Is Colette there?' Then he raised his voice in a plaintive howl. "'Are you there, Colette, while I'm kicking my heels on these tiles?' "'Clifford is capable of anything,' said Rodan. "'His nature is soured since Rue Barry sat on him.' Elliot raised his voice. "'I say, you fellows, we saw some flowers carried into Rue Barry's house at noon.' "'Posies and roses,' specified Rodan. "'Probably for her.' added Elliot, caressing his bulldog. Clifford turned with sudden suspicion upon Selby. The latter hummed a tune, selected a pair of gloves, and, choosing a dozen cigarettes, placed them in a case. Then, walking over to the cactus, he deliberately detached a blossom, drew it through his buttonhole, and, picking up hat and stick, smiled upon Clifford, at which the latter was mightily troubled. 4. Monday morning at Julian's, students fought for places. Students with prior claims drove away others who had been anxiously squatting on coveted tabrets since the door was opened in hopes of appropriating them at roll call. Students squabbled over pallets, brushes, portfolios, or rent the air with demands for scissory and bread. The former, a dirty ex-model who had in palmier days posed as Judas, now dispensed stale bread at one sou and made enough to keep himself in cigarettes. Monsieur Julian walked in, smiled a fatherly smile, and walked out. His disappearance was followed by the apparition of the clerk, a foxy creature who flitted through the battling hordes in search of prey. Three men who had not paid dues were caught and summoned. A fourth was scented, followed, outflanked, his retreat towards the door cut off, and finally captured behind the stove. About that time, the revolution assuming an acute form, howls rose for jewels. 
Jules came, umpired two fights with a sad resignation in his big brown eyes, shook hands with everybody, and melted away in the throng, leaving an atmosphere of peace and goodwill. The lions sat down with the lambs, the Massiers marked the best places for themselves and friends, and mounting the model stands, opened the roll calls. The word was passed, they begin with C this week. They did. Clisson! Clisson jumped like a flash, and marked his name on the floor in chalk before a front seat. Karen! Karen galloped away to secure his place. Bang! went an easel. Nom de Dieu! in French. Where in hell are you going? in English. Crash! A paint box fell with brushes and all on board. Dieu de de! spat. A blow, a short rush, a clinch and scuffle, and the voice of the Massier, stern and reproachful. Cushion! Then the roll call was resumed. Clifford! The Massier paused and looked up, one finger between the leaves of the ledger. Clifford! Clifford was not there. He was about three miles away in a direct line, and every instant increased the distance. Not that he was walking fast. On the contrary, he was strolling with that leisurely gait peculiar to himself. Elliot was beside him, and two bulldogs covered the rear. Elliot was reading the Gil Blas, from which he seemed to extract amusement, but deeming boisterous mirth unsuitable to Clifford's state of mind, subdued his amusement to a series of discreet smiles. The latter, moodily aware of this, said nothing, but leading the way into the Luxembourg gardens, installed himself upon a bench by the northern terrace, and surveyed the landscape with disfavour. Elliot, according to the Luxembourg regulations, tied the two dogs, and then, with an interrogative glance toward his friend, resumed the Gil Blas and the discreet smiles. The day was perfect. The sun hung over Notre Dame, setting the city in a glitter. The tender foliage of the chestnuts cast a shadow over the terrace, and flecked the paths and walks with tracery so blue that Clifford might here have found encouragement for his violent impressions, had he but looked. But, as usual in this period of his career, his thoughts were anywhere except in his profession. Around about, the sparrows quarrelled and chattered their courtship songs, the big rosy pigeon sailed from tree to tree, the flies whirled in the sunbeams, and the flowers exhaled a thousand perfumes, which stirred Clifford with languorous wistfulness. Under this influence, he spoke. Elliot, you are a true friend. You make me ill, replied the latter, folding his paper. It's just as I thought. You are tagging after some new petticoat again, and, he continued wrathfully, if this is what you've kept me away from Julian's for, if it's to fill me up with the perfections of some little idiot— Not idiot, remonstrated Clifford gently. See here, cried Elliot. Have you the nerve to try to tell me that you're in love again? Again? Yes, again and again and again, and by George, have you? This, observed Clifford sadly, is serious. For a moment Elliot would have laid hands on him, and he laughed from sheer helplessness. Oh, go on, go on, let's see. There's Clemence and Marie Telec and Cassette and Fafine, Colette, Marie Verdier, all of whom are charming, most charming, but I never was serious. So help me, Moses, said Elliot solemnly. Each and every one of those named have separately, and in turn, torn your heart with anguish, and have also made me lose my place at Julian's in this same manner, each and every one, separately and in turn. Do you deny it? What you say may be founded on facts, in a way, but give me the credit of being faithful to one at a time. Until the next came along. But this, this is really very different. Elliot, believe me, I am all broken up. Then, there being nothing else to do, Elliot gnashed his teeth and listened. It's, it's Rue Barry. Well, observed Elliot, with scorn, if you're moping and moaning over that girl, the girl who has given you and myself every reason to wish that the ground would open and engulf us, well, go on. I'm going on. I don't care. Timidity has fled. Yes, your native timidity. I'm desperate, Elliot. Am I in love? Never. Never did I feel so damn miserable. I can't sleep. Honestly, I'm incapable of eating properly. Same symptoms noticed in the case of Colette. Listen, will you? Hold on a moment. I know the rest by heart. Now let me ask you something. Is it your belief that Rue Barry is a pure girl? Yes, 
said Clifford, turning red. Do you love her, not as you dangle and tiptoe after every pretty inanity? I mean, do you honestly love her? Yes, said the other doggedly. I would. Hold on a moment. Would you marry her? Clifford turned scarlet. Yes, he muttered. Pleasant news for your family, growled Elliot in suppressed fury. Dear father, I have just married a charming grisette, whom I'm sure you'll welcome with open arms, in company with her mother, a most estimable and cleanly wash lady. Good heavens, this seems to have gone a little further than the rest. Thank your stars, young man, that my head is level enough for us both. Still, in this case, I have no fear. Rue Barry sat on your aspirations in a manner unmistakably final. Rue Barry, began Clifford, drawing himself up, but he suddenly ceased. For there, where the dappled sunlight glowed in spots of gold, along the sun-flecked path, tripped Rue Barry. Her gown was spotless, and her big straw hat, tipped a little from the white forehead, threw a shadow across her eyes. Elliot stood up and bowed. Clifford removed his head covering with an air so plaintive, so appealing, so utterly humble, that Rue Barry smiled. The smile was delicious, and when Clifford, incapable of sustaining himself on his legs from sheer astonishment, toppled slightly, she smiled again in spite of herself. A few moments later, she took a chair on the terrace, and drawing a book from her music roll, turned the pages, found the place, and then placing it open downwards in her lap, sighed a little, smiled a little, and looked out over the city. She had entirely forgotten Foxhall Clifford. After a while, she took up her book again, but instead of reading, began to adjust a rose in her corsage. The rose was big and red. It glowed like fire there, over her heart, and like fire it warmed her heart, now fluttering under the silken petals. Rue Barry sighed again. She was very happy. The sky was so blue, the air so soft and perfumed, the sunshine so caressing, and her heart sang within her, sang to the rose in her breast. This is what it sang. Out of the throng of passers-by, out of the world of yesterday, out of the millions passing, one has turned aside to me. So her heart sang under his rose on her breast. Then two big mouse-coloured pigeons came whistling by, and alighted on the terrace, where they bowed and strutted and bobbed and turned, until Rue Barry laughed in delight, and looking up, beheld Clifford before her. His hat was in his hand, and his face was wreathed in a series of appealing smiles, which would have touched the heart of a Bengal tiger. For an instant, Rue Barry frowned. Then she looked curiously at Clifford. Then, when she saw the resemblance between his bows and the bobbing pigeons, in spite of herself, her lips parted in the most bewitching laugh. Was this Rue Barry? So changed, so changed that she did not know herself? But, oh, that song in her heart, which drowned all else, which trembled on her lips, struggling for utterance, which rippled forth in a laugh at nothing, at a strutting pigeon, and Mr. Clifford. And you think, because I return the salute of the students in the quarter, that you may be received in particular as a friend? I do not know you, monsieur, but Vanity is man's other name. Be content, monsieur Vanity. I shall be punctilious, oh, most punctilious, in returning your salute. But I beg, I implore you to let me render you that homage which has so long— Oh, dear, I don't care for homage. Let me only be permitted to speak to you now and then, occasionally, very occasionally. And if you, why not another? Not at all. I will be discretion itself. Discretion? Why? Her eyes were very clear. Anne Clifford winced for a moment, but only for a moment. Then the devil of recklessness seizing him, he sat down and offered himself soul and body, goods and chattels. And all the time he knew he was a fool, and that infatuation is not love, and that each word he uttered bound him in honour, from which there was no escape. And all the time Elliot was scowling down on the fountain plaza, and savagely checking both bulldogs from their desire to rush to Clifford's rescue, for even they felt there was something wrong, as Elliot stormed within himself and growled maledictions. When Clifford finished, he finished in a glow of excitement, 
but Rue Barry's response was long in coming, and his ardour cooled, while the situation slowly assumed its just proportions. Then regret began to creep in, but he put that aside, and broke out again in protestations. At the first word, Rue Barry checked him. I thank you, she said, speaking very gravely. No man has ever before offered me marriage. She turned and looked out over the city. After a while, she spoke again. You offer me a great deal. I am alone. I have nothing. I am nothing. She turned again and looked at Paris, brilliant, fair, in the sunshine of a perfect day. He followed her eyes. Oh, she murmured. It is hard, hard to work always, always alone, with never a friend you can have in honour, and the love that is offered means the streets, the boulevard, when passion is dead. I know it, we know it, we others who have nothing, have no one, and who give ourselves, unquestioning when we love, yes, unquestioning, heart and soul, knowing the end. She touched the rose at her breast. For a moment, she seemed to forget him, then quietly. I thank you. I am very grateful. She opened the book and, plucking a petal from the rose, dropped it between the leaves. Then, looking up, she said gently, I cannot accept. 5. It took Clifford a month to entirely recover, although at the end of the first week he was pronounced convalescent by Elliot, who was an authority, and his convalescence was aided by the cordiality with which Rue Barry acknowledged his solemn salutes. Forty times a day he blessed Rue Barry for her refusal, and thanked his lucky stars, and at the same time, O oh, wondrous heart of ours, he suffered the tortures of the blighted. Elliot was annoyed, partly by Clifford's reticence, partly by the unexplainable thaw in the frigidity of Rue Barry. At their frequent encounters, when she, tripping along the Rue de Seine, with music roll and big straw hat, would pass Clifford and his familiars, steering an easterly course to the Café Vasset, and at the respectful uncovering of the band would colour and smile at Clifford, Elliot's slumbering suspicions awoke. But he never found out anything, and finally gave it up as beyond his comprehension, merely qualifying Clifford as an idiot, and reserving his opinion of Rue Barry. And all this time, Selby was jealous. At first, he refused to acknowledge it to himself, and cut the studio for a day in the country, but the woods and fields of course aggravated his case, and the brooks babbled of Rue Barry, and the mowers calling to each other across the meadow ended in a quavering, Rue Barry. That day spent in the country made him angry for a week, and he worked sulkily at Julian's, all the time tormented by a desire to know where Clifford was, and what he might be doing. This culminated in an erratic stroll on Sunday, which ended at the flower market on the Pont de Change, began again, was gloomily extended to the morgue, and again ended at the marble bridge. It would never do, and Selby felt it, so he went to see Clifford, who was convalescing on mint juleps in his garden. They sat down together, and discussed morals and human happiness, and each found the other most entertaining, only Selby failed to pump Clifford, to the other's unfeigned amusement. But the julep spread balm on the sting of jealousy, and trickled hope to the blighted, and when Selby said he must go, Clifford went too, and when Selby, not to be outdone, insisted on accompanying Clifford back to his door, Clifford determined to see Selby back halfway, and then finding it hard to part, they decided to dine together and flit. To flit, a verb applied to Clifford's nocturnal prowls, expressed, perhaps, as well as anything, the gaiety proposed. Dinner was ordered at Mignon's, and while Selby interviewed the chef, Clifford kept a fatherly eye on the butler. The dinner was a success, or was of the sort generally termed a success. Toward the dessert, Selby heard someone say, as at a great distance, "'Kid Selby, drunk as a lord!' A group of men passed near them. It seemed to him that he shook hands and laughed a great deal, and that everybody was very witty. There was Clifford opposite, swearing undying confidence in his chum Selby, and there seemed to be others there, either seated beside them, 
or continually passing with the swish of skirts on the polished floor, the perfume of roses, the rustle of fans, the touch of rounded arms, and the laughter grew vaguer and vaguer. The room seemed enveloped in mist. Then, all in a moment, each object stood out painfully distinct. Only forms and visages were distorted, and voices piercing. He drew himself up, calm, grave, for the moment master of himself, but very drunk. He knew he was drunk, and was as guarded and alert, as keenly suspicious of himself, as he would have been of a thief at his elbow. His self-command enabled Clifford to hold his head safely under some running water, and repair to the street considerably the worse for wear, but never suspecting that his companion was drunk. For a time, he kept his self-command. His face was only a bit paler, a bit tighter than usual. He was only a trifle slower and more fastidious in his speech. It was midnight when he left Clifford peacefully slumbering in somebody's armchair, with a long suede glove dangling in his hand and a plumy boa twisted about his neck to protect his throat from draughts. He walked through the hall and down the stairs, and found himself on the sidewalk in a quarter he did not know. Mechanically, he looked up at the name of the street. The name was not familiar. He turned and steered his course towards some lights clustered at the end of the street. They proved farther away than he had anticipated, and after a long quest, he came to the conclusion that his eyes had been mysteriously removed from their proper places, and had been reset on either side of his head like those of a bird. It grieved him to think of the inconvenience this transformation might occasion him, and he attempted to cock up his head, hen-like, to test the mobility of his neck. Then an immense despair stole over him, tears gathered in the tear-ducts, his heart melted, and he collided with a tree. This shocked him into comprehension. He stifled the violent tenderness in his breast, picked up his hat, and moved on more briskly. His mouth was white and drawn, his teeth tightly clenched. He held his course pretty well, and strayed but little, and after an apparently interminable length of time, found himself passing a line of cabs. The brilliant lamps, red, yellow, and green, annoyed him, and he felt it might be pleasant to demolish them with his cane, but mastering this impulse, he passed on. Later, an idea struck him, that it would save fatigue to take a cab, and he started back with that intention, but the cab seemed already so far away, and the lanterns were so bright and confusing, that he gave it up, and pulling himself together, looked around. A shadow, a mass, huge, undefined, rose to his right. He recognized the Arc de Triomphe, and gravely shook his cane at it. Its size annoyed him. He felt it was too big. Then he heard something fall, clattering to the pavement, and thought probably it was his cane, but it didn't much matter. When he had mastered himself and regained control of his right leg, which betrayed symptoms of insubordination, he found himself traversing the Place de la Concorde, at a pace which threatened to land him at the Madeleine. This would never do. He turned sharply to the right, and crossing the bridge past the Palais Bourbon, at a trot, and wheeled into the Boulevard Saint-Germain. He got on well enough, although the size of the war office struck him as a personal insult, and he missed his cane, which it would have been pleasant to drag along the iron railings as he passed. It occurred to him, however, to substitute his hat, but when he found it, he forgot what he wanted it for, and replaced it upon his head with gravity. Then he was obliged to battle with a violent inclination to sit down and weep. This lasted until he came to the Rue de Rennes, but there he became absorbed in contemplating the dragon on the balcony, overhanging the corps de dragon, and time slipped away, until he remembered vaguely that he had no business there, and marched off again. It was slow work. The inclination to sit down and weep had given place to a desire for solitary and deep reflection. Here his right leg forgot its obedience, and attacking the left, outflanked it, and brought him up against a wooden board, which seemed to bar his path. He tried to walk around it, but found the street closed. He tried to push it over, and found he couldn't. Then he noticed a red lantern standing on a pile of paving stones inside the barrier. This was pleasant. How was he to get home if the boulevard was blocked? 
but he was not on the boulevard. His treacherous right leg had beguiled him into a detour, for there, behind him, lay the boulevard, with its endless line of lamps, and here, what was this narrow, dilapidated street piled up with earth and mortar and heaps of stone? He looked up. Written in staring black letters on the barrier was Rue Barry. He sat down. Two policemen, whom he knew, came by and advised him to get up, but he argued the question from a standpoint of personal taste, and they passed on, laughing, for he was at that moment absorbed in a problem. It was how to see Rue Barry. She was somewhere or other in that big house with the iron balconies, and the door was locked. But what of that? The simple idea struck him to shout until she came. This idea was replaced by another equally lucid, to hammer on the door until she came. But finally, rejecting both of these as too uncertain, he decided to climb into the balcony, and opening a window, politely inquire for Rue Barry. There was but one lighted window in the house that he could see. It was on the second floor, and toward this he cast his eyes. Then, mounting the wooden barrier and clambering over the piles of stones, he reached the sidewalk and looked up at the façade for a foothold. It seemed impossible, but a sudden fury seized him, a blind, drunken obstinacy, and the blood rushed to his head, leaping, beating in his ears like the dull thunder of an ocean. He set his teeth, and springing at a window sill, dragged himself up and hung to the iron bars. Then reason fled. There surged in his brain the sound of many voices. His heart leaped up, beating a mad tattoo, and gripping at cornice and ledge, he worked his way along the façade, clung to pipes and shutters, and dragged himself up, over and into the balcony by the lighted window. His hat fell off, and rolled against the pane. For a moment, he leaned breathless against the railing. Then the window was slowly opened from within. They stared at each other for some time. Presently, the girl took two unsteady steps back into the room. He saw her face, all crimsoned now. He saw her sink into a chair by the lamp-lit table, and without a word he followed her into the room, closing the big door-like panes behind him. Then they looked at each other in silence. The room was small and white. Everything was white about it. The curtained bed, the little washstand in the corner, the bare walls, the china lamp, and his own face, had he known it, but the face and neck of Rue were surging in the colour that dyed the blossoming rose-tree there on the hearth beside her. It did not occur to him to speak. She seemed not to expect it. His mind was struggling with the impressions of the room. The whiteness, the extreme purity of everything occupied him, began to trouble him. As his eye became accustomed to the light, other objects grew from the surroundings and took their places in the circle of lamplight. There was a piano, and a coal scuttle, and a little iron trunk, and a bathtub. Then there was a row of wooden pegs against the door, with a white chintz curtain covering the clothes underneath. On the bed lay an umbrella, and a big straw hat, and on the table a music roll unfurled, an inkstand, and sheets of ruled paper. Behind him stood a wardrobe faced with a mirror, but somehow he did not care to see his own face just then. He was sobering. The girl sat looking at him without a word. Her face was expressionless, yet the lips at times trembled almost imperceptibly. Her eyes, so wonderfully blue in the daylight, seemed dark and soft as velvet, and the colour on her neck deepened and whitened with every breath. She seemed smaller and more slender than when he had seen her in the street, and there was now something in the curve of her cheek, almost infantine. When at last he turned and caught his own reflection in the mirror behind him, a shock passed through him, as though he had seen a shameful thing, and his clouded mind and his clouded thoughts grew clearer. For a moment their eyes met, then his sought the floor, his lips tightened, and the struggle within him bowed his head, and strained every nerve to the breaking. And now it was over, for the voice within had spoken. He listened, dully interested, but already knowing the end. Indeed, it little mattered. The end would always be the same for him. He understood now, always the same for him. And he listened, dully interested, to a voice which grew within him. After a while, he stood up, 
and she rose at once, one small hand resting on the table. Presently he opened the window, picked up his hat, and shut it again. Then he went over to the rose bush and touched the blossoms with his face. One was standing in a glass of water on the table, and mechanically the girl drew it out, pressed it with her lips, and laid it on the table beside him. He took it without a word, and crossing the room, opened the door. The landing was dark and silent, but the girl lifted the lamp and glided past him, slipped down the polished stairs to the hallway. Then, unchaining the bolts, she drew open the iron wicket. Through this he passed with his rose.